Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Stephen Wolfe, the man who unsuccessfully tried to stand for the UKIP leadership this summer and was then treated in hospital after a clash with a party colleague when he was favoured for a rerun, has announced that he's quitting the party. In his statement this evening, he said that UKIP was, quote, riddled with infighting and ungovernable without Nigel Farage as leader. Well, our correspondent Kieran Jenkins is in Westminster. Kieran, tell us more. Well, having been on the receiving end, he says, of a, of a smack to the head, Stephen Wolfe has tonight dealt UKIP a pretty severe blow. Uh, not only is he not standing in the leadership contest, he is leaving UKIP. Remember, this is one of UKIP's most recognisable, most senior figures. It all comes after an alleged bust-up with Mike Hookham, another UKIP MEP in Strasbourg, alleged because Stephen Wolfe says he punched him, Mike Hookham says he did not. The upshot tonight is Stephen Wolfe saying that not only that he can't govern the UKIP, but that UKIP itself is ungovernable. Uh, I am withdrawing my application uh, for leadership of UKIP. I'm withdrawing my uh, name from UKIP and I'm now going to stand as an independent MEP to allow myself to get out of the quagmire that has become the infighting, the bitterness and the internecine warfare that's just going on that's making the whole party ungovernable and actually unfriendly uh, to be in. Now, Mike Hookham denies any wrongdoing, of course, but this is an extraordinary position that UKIP have found themselves in just a few months after riding high after the referendum. Then Nigel Farage stood down. Then a new leader, Diane James, quit after 18 days. And tonight, Stephen Wolfe, who is regarded by many as a rising star within the party, somebody who could take them on, take them to the next level, has himself quit. The old saying goes that uh, divided parties can't win elections. Well, this divided party can't even seem to hold a leadership election. <laughs> Kieran, thanks very much. Fourteen children arrived in Britain today from the Calais refugee camp. All have relatives in this country and have a right to residence. They are among the first of more than a hundred who will be coming over the next few weeks. Porrick O'Brien has this report. This is what reuniting families looks like. Two teenage brothers arrived from Calais, meet their father at St Pancras station last week. This week, ahead of camp demolition, the process of relocating under 18s goes into overdrive. A busload of 14 young men arrive in South London this morning from the jungle camp. Their reception, typically British, polite applause. Sorry. No, it's okay. When you've waited this long to see your brother, the minutes just before you do feel the longest. Why are you here today? I just come to see my brother who come from Calais, from difficulties. So just lovely. When was the last time you saw your brother? I've been saw him from last 11 years ago. 11 years ago. 11 years ago was the last yeah. time you saw last your brother? Last time I saw my brothers. So I will see him after 11 years. It's a lovely day for me. Asif says he left Tora Bora on the Afghan-Pakistan border in 2006. His little brother Emil arrived from the jungle Calais this morning. He's 14. I just want to say thanks to UK government to receive our children from Calais. And thanks everyone who was involved in this case, in this issue. Oh, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely. I'm just wiping to see my brother. On cue, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. Churches and charities have been lobbying the Home Office for months to fast-track this relocation. How sure are you that all of these children's claims are legit? They've already been scrutinised by the Home Office, um, and I think that's, that's what we need. We need a dependable process for that. Nobody's saying that we just sign blank cheques. We do want a process that examines claims, that checks that the family relationships are real ones. That's what's happening. We need it to be in operation more extensively 
and more professionally within the next few days because the clock is ticking here. And the clock is ticking. For Helen, for example, the young woman from Ethiopia we met last week, still stuck in the jungle. For Lala Ra, ditto. Shafi, when did you arrive here in the jungle? The system has worked, though, for other children we've been following. Earlier this year, we met Shafi from Afghanistan. Last week, the family friend looking after him told us he'd been reunited with his uncle in Britain. How is he? Have you been talking to him recently? Yeah, I, I talked to him. He was good. Like, he was laughing. Like, right now I'm good. You know, I can go everywhere. I can play football with the kids. <laughs> Up to 200 children will arrive in the UK over the coming couple of weeks. There is a process to go through, though, and in the meantime, snatched moments near the end of the Odyssey. I've been